What's today been like? Good? Okay. Hi, Phoebe. <laughs> Thanks for coming along. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the state of the world at the moment. Uh, I think some other people might feel that way too. And I think that the people who are in this room, and the kind of people who are in this room all over the world, are the people best positioned to do something about everything that's wrong with the world right now. And I want to talk you through why. So right now, there's a lot of concerning things happening everywhere. Uh, there's also this problem where the people who are best positioned to do something about this are being ripped off, particularly in this country, every day. And I'm extremely pissed off about the behavior of the local investor scene. And I am going to be ripping through this halfway through this presentation because these guys are killing the people who are best positioned to do something to fix our future. I'm also concerned that even well-intentioned founders who are doing the best they can to put a business together are making common mistakes, easily avoidable mistakes, and they're not, they don't have access to the best advice and the way to really fix things. And so I'm going to be sharing a few tools to help that. So the first thing we're doing is we're building a big plan, building a big plan to address everything that's wrong with the world. The second thing we're doing is protecting founders from predatory investors, particularly in Australia. And the third thing we're doing is sharing some really strong tools that are going to be able to help founders prevent their businesses from failing. So what do I mean when I say the world's on fire? Right now, we have a problem where globalization has dramatically changed the economic opportunities available to people. We have a situation where a good chunk of the population in developed countries has lost out over the last 30 years. That big gap you see there on the right, the, the right-hand gray piece, shows that people in the lower and middle class in America and Australia, and all those kinds of areas, have missed out on economic opportunity because the 1% have shifted their ability overseas, their ability to make money overseas. And what's happened is they're now afraid of what's going to happen for them in the future. They're afraid, how do I make money? How on earth do I make money? How do I provide for myself? How do I provide for my family? They are not sure how to do this. And this is very upsetting and confronting to them, and they're making the kinds of decisions that, that we're seeing them make. This is a problem. So uh, what can we do to prevent these people from feeling like they have no opportunity, feeling like there's no path forward for them, feeling like they learned how to drive a coal truck, and there was a great market for driving a coal truck, and then that market evaporated, and now they are screwed. Well, we can make sure they know how to build companies. Because if you know how to build a company, if you know how to found something new, then it doesn't matter what happens anymore. It doesn't matter if the job that someone else created for you disappears, because you can build one for yourself. And that creates a very different kind of political conversation. So. Let's have a look what that plan looks like. Our goal is to make everyone feel capable of being a founder. It doesn't mean they have to go out and found a company, but they have to feel like they could if they wanted to, because that will take away the fear of them losing their job. It means we're going to advance a lot faster, of course. It means many more ideas are going to get explored, because different perspectives can come into the world. And it means we can have economic stability and avoid some of the political problems that are happening right now. And those political problems are only going to get worse because the current state of affairs is due to globalization, but the next wave of problems is coming from automation. And that's what's really going to change things in a big way. So how do we do this? All right, a few simple elements of culture. We need to make sure that Founders, particularly from Australia, start speaking like founders from the US. When someone asks you what your company is doing, don't start by saying something like this. Well, we've just pivoted. Uh, not. So the thing is, look, 
we haven't, we haven't quite figured it out yet. At this point, everyone's already forgotten what you're doing, why you're doing it, and they don't care anymore. And this is something I keep saying because people keep doing it over and over again in this country. And we've got to stop. We've got to change the way we talk. Investors need to start working on the instruments that are common in Silicon Valley. They need to start working on safe documents, simple agreements for future equity. This is how, this is the standard investor template that Y Combinator has published, and investors need to start using it here. It's a much fairer deal for founders, and it prevents valuation discussions dragging on. It prevents unnecessary corporate structures being set up early, and it ensures that really strong companies don't have all the equity taken out of them early on. We need a fair deal for employees. You think when you go and work for an early stage company, you, you get some options, right? You get this great deal like, yeah, look, my salary is pretty low, but at least I get some shares. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Normally what happens is you get those shares or the options to buy the shares, and then if you leave the company, you know, you've, you've been there a year or two, you've earned them properly, you've vested, you've vested these, these options. But then if you leave the company, the standard documents mean that 90 days, within 90 days of leaving the company, you must hand over cash for those options to actually turn into shares and become yours. And if you don't do that within 90 days, they evaporate. All those years of work that you put in on the understanding it was for equity are lost. They evaporate. They're gone. So that's not a very fair deal. And YC has been asking people to change this to 10 years, and I'm asking them to do the same. And I think this is going to create a much better situation where you actually have time to figure out if the company is valuable, and essentially you sell the stock on the same day that you buy it, and that way you're never out of pocket. Uh, I don't want to have the kind of toxic community situation that's existed where people on buses in San Francisco are literally throwing up forcing themselves to throw up on the buses that take the tech company people to work because there's just such a war between the community and them. Like, there's got to be a better way. We've got to have people in the community see tech and startups as a good thing. Like, yes, there's some more tech people coming to the neighborhood. Yes, let's go and make it easy for them to do that. It doesn't take a lot to do that. Mark Benioff's done a really good job. Runs Salesforce. He's got great community initiatives. I know Atlassian's doing really well with that as well. The 1-1 one, one pledge, one, pledge is a really simple way to do that. So, you know, all that means is giving up 1% of your equity, 1% of your stock, and 1% of your, sorry, 1% of your profit, 1% of your employees' time to the community, right? And now everyone's actually on the same side, and they're working together. Uh, universities, just do that one quickly. Uh, we want to make sure that there's no raids, like what Uber did to Carnegie Mellon, scooped up the entire robotics faculty, because that's going to make a, people want to create distance between the tech industry. But at the same time, universities need to come to the table as well. They need to stop asking for double-digit equity for patent licenses. They need to stop messing around with you know, long processes. Because startups, the, the only advantage they have is speed. So if you take that away from them with a long process, then you've, you've basically killed them, right? Uh, and I'm making a couple of policy suggestions for government as well, mostly around just tightening things up in line with uh, the way uh, corporations are structured in the US to make it just a little bit easier to move forward. All right. So the other thing that I'd love people to work on is really hard, deep problems. So Australia is the best in the world at computer vision. This is a fundamentally powerful technology that sits underneath self-driving cars, drones, virtual reality, augmented reality, automated medical diagnostics, automated surgery. Like, could you imagine a more valuable thing to be doing? The people who have this skill are worth 10 to $30 million to a company. Cruise automation with 30 engineers got bought by GM for a billion dollars. Right? That's, that's insane. They're not the only ones like this. Prime, sorry, not Prime Sense. Uh, the, the underlying technology that goes in the, uh, used to go in the Tesla self driving cars, Mobileye, that company is worth $8 billion. It has 550 employees. Right? Like, these skills are extremely valuable. Australia is the best at this. Right? The inventor of SLAM has been at Sydney University running the Australian Centre for Field Robotics. That's the underlying original computer vision algorithm. We have the best people in the world. There's no reason why we shouldn't be engaging them and, and working on these, these deep techs. So let's have a look at a couple of deep tech startups I've had the, uh, the fortunate opportunity to see recently. Um, I'll welcome onto the stage uh, Anastasia, who uh, has a startup, Fluorosat. Fluorosat is a nanosatellite. Hey, Anastasia. Um, yeah, give her a round of applause. So the satellite that Anastasia's holding 
uh, contains a hyperspectral imaging camera. Uh, that camera can look at crops and see two weeks before you can tell with your own eye that there's a problem with the crops. That allows you to intervene early, use fewer chemicals, and get much higher yields. Thanks, Anastasia. If you want to talk to Anastasia afterwards, uh, she will be sitting uh, near the door, so you can come up and learn more about Fluoroset. Cool, thank you. Um, the, uh, the next person I'll bring up is Byron. Uh, Byron uh, has a company, uh, it's called Nearsat. Nearsat, if we can get it through the door, <laughs> Nearsat is an ultra-high altitude, 20 kilometer altitude solar drone. All right, so this drone can actually stay up all day with solar power. It uses a platform for sensors, communications technology. Cool. Byron will be there as well if you want to hear more about, about Nearsat. Thanks, Byron. Cool. Um, all right. Can have a few more photos? That's all right. We'll, we'll, get you, we'll get you out. All right, so we're really good at this stuff. Like, we have medical technology. We, Australians invented the vaccine for cervical cancer. They invented cochlear. We're really good at this stuff, but we only have a few uh, examples of commercialization. Okay, so that's, a, that's another piece to get anyone to be a founder. Um, the other big piece is education, so we'll go through that. So the first thing is, uh, you know, the top of the, top of the sort of generation into companies is accelerators. So programs like Y Combinator that I went through and Muradi that I'm operating in Sydney at the moment. So these are, you know, sort of full programs that'll take your company all the way up to the stage of getting funding. Uh, there's also some pre-accelerator programs run by universities uh, in Australia and, and some community uh, groups as well. Prior to that, um, I strongly recommend a unit called Inventing the Future. I'm going to invite up Bronwyn Darlington. This is a, uh, a unit from Sydney University. Hey, Bronwyn. Um, so Bronwyn's going to talk for a couple of minutes about what Inventing the Future does. Cool. Um, I came into university at the University of Sydney about five years ago from industry, but also from running a startup that actually made stuff. And I came to uni because there was a question that industry couldn't answer, and I thought, you know what, that's what unis are for. And when I got there, I realised that there is a research bench strength and a manufacturing capacity that in industry we just don't get to connect with. And what I also realised is that students get to do some of the most boring assignments on the planet as we try to teach them to invent stuff. So I met a physicist who became a dear friend, Marianne, which is the weirdest thing if you come from business and you get to meet the coolest people at university. And I realised everyone was not having that experience. And we would sit down and go, why, should, why is it like this? Why, should, why do inventors just not have access to all this cool information, these cool technologies, these cool maker spaces? And we thought, you know, what we should do is we should connect the smartest students doing masters and PhD students, PhD studies with students from other faculties. Physicists should talk to engineers. Engineers should talk to designers. And for goodness sake, business students should actually be there when the idea is created so they can work out if there is a market from the very, very beginning. So what we did was actually do that this last semester. We pulled together in addition to just some smart students, access to the intellectual bank that is Sydney University. We built on the research strengths to solve real problems, the key problems, not just a tweak, not just improve an idea of today, but say, look, we have some serious issues to face as society, and you guys, it's your future. So what we wanted them to do was throw the fishing line out, not just to the edge of the known horizon, but right over it. And then we connected them with every brain that would talk to them, which was absolutely incredible. We then gave them resources to develop a prototype. So in a 13-week, which will be four-credit study program, they actually got to create things like the nanosatellite that you just saw from Anastasia, a wearable melanoma detection device. They were able to create green roofing systems and an algorithm that is able to predict where mining for rare materials can occur in publicly available data. And then they pitched it to the chancellor of the university and to a whole pile of industry people who have then fought over them to give them funding since. So why, we called it Inventing the Future because it's their future and universities have got to get so much better at connecting students who are going to live that future with the massive resource that is held in the universities. So that's what we're doing at Sydney. 
Thanks so much, Ben. Oh, thanks, Roman. Uh, you got to you got to come this way. Sorry. <laughs> So how cool is that, right? Imagine if that was everyone's experience of university, right? Going and building a fluoro set. I think I think we've got to we've got to get it there. So before inventing the future, I'm working with a few universities on what I call a primer unit. The primer unit exposes uh, students to some of the technical problems, like we've spoken about, and we're also going to share some of the teaching tools that uh, I'll cover in the the last section of the presentation. It's just a way to get a bit more familiar with how to found things, so you're not diving straight in at the deep end. Now, into how school should be structured, universities should be structured, I'm going to suggest one tweak. And it's based on what happens at Waterloo, which is a university in Canada. And this university is perhaps even stronger than Stanford now in generating entrepreneurs. Their approach is absolutely phenomenal. And all they've done is just make sure that the students have to spend six months uh, studying and then six months in industry and go back and forth. And that six months is actually long enough to get a real feedback loop happening. The company you know, has to actually get value from them in that time. And so what are the natural things that happen from just changing those dates slightly? You go and sit in an industry environment, and you say, well, hey, here's this new algorithm, this new approach that I picked up in the lab. Maybe we should try it here. And then when you come back to university, you say, hey, look, these things that you're teaching me right now, it's, it, the coding's a little bit outdated. Maybe you could teach us some of the stuff that's a bit more common in industry right now. And so these feedback loops just make the entire system stronger. And all the university projects aren't fake. They're, you get pitched by the people running the companies what they're actually going to be then doing when you go to the company. So when you come up with your you know, group exercise at university, you better actually be serious about what you're doing because you're about to spend six months at work doing that. So that reality check is, I think, really, really powerful. Now, prior to that, into high school, the NCSS program set up by Sydney University is extremely strong. It essentially allows, you know, 10 days residential kids to, to build their own Facebook, right? Like, what an exposure to programming is the first opportunity. So this is in high school. Uh, a little earlier in high school, the Cube Writer program. So this is set up by uh, a, uh, actually a Muradi company. So Cube Writer have figured out how to get kids to be so excited about programming, they'll actually skip their other classes to do it. They've got an equal distribution of girls and boys without even trying. And this is the first exposure of students have to programming. So how on earth did they do that? Well, they built a sensor board. They let kids write experiments for it. it. had cameras, gyroscopes, accelerometers, things like that. And say, sure, sure, that's been done before. The difference is that then all those experiments get loaded onto a single master sensor board, get taken to a rocket and sent to the International Space Station, where those experiments are then run by astronauts. That is the first piece of code these students write. What an introduction. Before that, Code Club reaches 60,000 students already in Australia, primary, primary age students now. So these primary age students are getting exposure to coding. And we can go before that, right? There are toys, Cubetto, Ozobot, and Sparrow, which teach toddlers how to code, all right? And, and how, do, how would they do that? There's no screen. This isn't even screen time. This is them sitting down with colored markers and drawing lines on paper, and the robots follow them around or bounce off them. They're programming with, with colored textures. That's possible right now for a two-year-old, for a three-year-old child. If you like this plan, or if you don't like this plan, <laughs> or you want to talk to me about this plan, please do that. If you send an email to that address, I'll get back to you and we can have a dialogue about this. Maybe you can help me improve it. Maybe you can help me implement some of it. I think it's important that we work on this. So this is the end of the first part of my presentation about a plan for, for founders to save the world. The next two parts are about how to deal with our troubling investor situation in Australia and some tools to help you develop your business. So we'll dive into them now. So, so uh, some of you who just arrived uh, didn't get my angry rant at the beginning, so don't worry, I'll, uh, I'll uh, 
As I start to see some of these words, I'll uh, channel that again. So, doesn't that slide look like a boring load of text? All right? And that is exactly the problem. When you encounter stuff like this, you just go, yeah, it's too hard. What is a put option? Who even cares, right? I'm sure it wouldn't be there if it wasn't normal, so I'll just, I'll just keep going. That's fine. And then you find out your company's screwed. So these aren't made up things, all right? These are all things that I've seen in Australian term sheets in the last three weeks that do not exist in Silicon Valley. All right? I'm not trying to paint some paradise land that doesn't exist. I'm just saying commercial practice in the biggest, most robust economy for building tech companies in the world does not look like this. It doesn't look like this. And the people doing this are killing the local industry. And if you see this in your documents, send them to me, right? Seriously, send them to me so we can work through this with you and clean this mess up. All right, so let's just, I'll just pick a few at random, all right? So put options, we start with them. A put option is the right for an investor to force someone else to buy their shares. They can force the company to buy them back, they can force another investor to buy them out. What investor in their right mind is going to come in and put more money into a company once there's some shark there with a put option? They're not gonna do it. It, it makes the company uninvestable, it's toxic. And now there's only one person who'll give you the money, the guy with the put option. And so they're gonna be able to call all the rest of the terms. Let's, uh, let's, what else have we got up there? You know, I've seen, uh, I've seen a really good one lately. Uh, they, um, the way they set up the situation for how the, the board is structured, right? So they will, they will create terms that say, you need, founders have board seats as long as they have 50% of the shares in the company. I'm okay, and you think, yeah, no worries, we got, we got all of them now, I mean, how long? That usually disappears at the second round, right? So by as the second round, you will not, there'll be a committee deciding how the company's run, and you as the founders will not be part of that. Someone else will be deciding how the, found, the company runs. All right? I mean, we could, we could go on and on and on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write about these on the website. I don't want to get too into it right now, but this is it's just terrible. All right? The other thing is, is the bad behavior, right? We've all seen these, these angel groups saying they'll, they'll never work with people with more than a few million dollars cap saying that trying to treat you like they're th this. When you go out and pitch to investors and you have a slide deck, okay, that is a normal thing to do to the final partnership meeting of a VC that has multiple billions of dollars in funds. Right? That's when it's normal. Before that, you have a normal conversation over coffee with some partners, and before that, you have a conversation over coffee with a single partner. That's normal, okay? And all the investor money that you take in earlier, like all the fifty, hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, all that stuff that happens early, is a twenty-minute chat over coffee at a Starbucks, a handshake deal on the spot, and money wired into account within a week, with about a two to five-page document signed. That's normal. That is not what happens here, right? You'll be arguing for months. You'll be asked to go through diligence phases. You'll be paraded around and and you know told to wait in the waiting room while the you know the powers that be decide what. Look, that's just bullshit. Do not stand for that anymore. Right? It's terrible. So, what are we going to do about it? Well, this is, this is you know, how, how investors would likely, like to be viewed right now. How the, particularly many of the angels in the Sydney community would like to be viewed right now. And that's how I'd like you to think of them. Right? That's what's actually going on. So here's what we're going to do about it. Badinvestors.com. All right? If you go there right now, put in your email address, do a couple of things. We're going to start building an investor rating database. They have these in America. Why don't we have one here? Well, that's going to change today. And the other thing we're going to do, if you sign up there, we'll give you a way to send us your term sheets. We'll review them. I can't promise we'll get to all of them. We'll review them, we'll anonymize the terms, and then we'll post them so you can look at the terms you've been offered and see how they compare. And all we're gonna say is what this will result happens in the future to your company, 
and what that means to your evaluation, your control, and so on, and particularly how this compares with standard commercial practice in Silicon Valley. Well, let's face it. Oh. Thanks. All right, so yeah, I'm, I'm pissed off. I'm glad you like this. <laughs> let's, let's clean up the mess. OK, all right. Um, I think, I think you know, I, I usually take a little bit just to get over the <sighs> of that. All right. I have actually have a little, uh, little wearable device that's meant to sense my mood, so it usually starts buzzing when, uh, when I'm talking about these topics. Um, OK, so all right, on to our, uh, our last piece. How to, help, uh, how to help people build startups. This is what I actually like doing, all right? What I, what I live for. I sit there and coach people you know, every day, 10, 15 hours a day, I'm sitting there coaching people how to make their company stronger. This is what I live for. Um, because there's just a lot of common mistakes that can be avoided. So let's, you know, let's clear them up. Let's prevent you making those mistakes. Um, all right, so you, know, you think, sure, right? There's all this advice out there. That's great. You know, Go and read a book, watch a video. I mean, does it even apply to me now? I don't know. Or I go and get you know, a bunch of advisors, go and join a program. That's like expensive, it's complicated, it takes a while to set up. So there's this sort of, you know, the automated approach is books, which are you know, huge and long to read and not tailored to your specific moment. And the in-person approach is, is kind of expensive and time consuming and uh, takes a while to set up. So is there a way we can start to automate that? I mean, ideally what I would like to do is sort of put a chip or at least a wearable or something and every founder, and when it sort of senses they're about to do something silly, it kind of jumps in and says, hey, that's been tried before, and here's what happened. <laughs> you know? Have you considered some other alternatives? Um, so that's where we'd like to get to. The first thing I'm going to do to get to that is just condense the advice, right? So no longer are you handed a book. Uh, I don't even want to hand you a chapter. I want to hand you a single card. Single card that's been tested to help people build their businesses. And we've built 40 of these so far. And we're going to be giving away a bunch of them at the end of the show today. So if you'd like some, you can, uh, you can get that and get an early taste. So let's, uh, let's take a look at a couple of those. All right, founder cards. So that's one I like. Went through this on the way up. So most people have difficulty talking in public. I know I do. I don't like being up here. Um, so. You know, there's a, there's a couple of techniques, and these techniques actually come from, from mindfulness training techniques. So these come from uh, the people who coach, the coaches of the San Francisco Giants. They come from the uh, not-for-profit called Innerspace. It's been set up to help Y Combinator companies kind of, uh, you know, not completely lose their mental coherence while they're founding, um, and to be better uh, leaders as well. Um, Let's take one of the examples off this one. So a lot of people talk about messaging. My, my favorite hack for messaging is, uh, is don't, if you want to come up with a new way of talking about how a product works, don't you know, get a bunch of you know, people in a room and a you know, whiteboard and start throwing around ideas. That's not going to teach you anything. You guys have known about this thing for years. Or maybe you go and get some expensive consultancy in. I've seen that happen a few times. You don't need to do any of that. It's an extremely easy way to do it. I was taught this one by a guy who actually made Super Bowl ads, um, and also by some people who ran some of the marketing for Apple. So, very simple, you just, you just ask your customers, what is this thing, what does it do? And use their words to explain it, because they're the ones who just learned, right? There's a reason that tutors at university are usually better at relating concepts to you than the lecturers. It's because the lecturers known it for 20 years, the tutors only known it for a few months. And so they're much more in the same headspace as someone who's learning about it for the first time. So that's, uh, that's a nice one. Um, this one is really important. I get a lot of people who mess this up. So the normal thing for an engineer to do is to start by building stuff, right? Very natural instinct. You're like, yeah, I have this idea. I've, just, I've figured it all out. I've worked it all out in my head. So I'm just going to go and sit in a box, sit in a cave for a while, and just build it all. And it's going to be great. And everyone's going to love it. And I've done that before. I've done that for a number of startups. And they all crashed and burned, right? Some of them look beautiful. I mean, they like, objectively, aesthetically look beautiful. The people who'd worked on them had done art for Halo and stuff. Like, it looked gorgeous. But the product did not come together in a way the market could relate to because it had been built disconnected from the market. So it's really, really important you, you follow this sequence, right? Pitch, prototype, sell, build. And do not build anything until you've got actual dollars 
of sales and investment until people are actually giving you money, right? A lot of people will say really nice, encouraging things to you. That's not reality. That's just them, you know, trying to make you happy. So when you ask them for money, that's when you actually know if they're serious or not. All right, and this one, I could go on for hours. Um, I feel like I've got a little bit more time than they suggested. I think this was meant to be a longer talk, so I'm just going to steal a couple of extra minutes. Is that all right, guys? I, I don't have a thing. I've got no idea. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to say yes. This is my last slide. This is the, for anyone who's had coaching, there's a few of you in the audience have had coaching from me. This is the one I go on and on and on and on about. Uh, it's the solution to about half your problems. If you draw up this chart and redo it monthly, this will solve most of the problems of your company. This is your entire business plan. It is the entire job description of everyone in the company, and it fits on about half an A4 page. Right? That's it. I don't, like, I don't like reading, you don't like writing. It saves us both the trouble. So what are we doing here, right? We're plotting out the company's goals from one week up to 10 years. All right? Fairly straightforward. Uh, in different areas. So what are you going to build? What's the feature? What's the actual meat of the product that's going to get made? Which market will that serve? Who has to be satisfied by this? Who has to pay money and like it? What is the net promoter score? What is the, how much do people like it? How much do they rave about it? How viral is this product? The MRR, the monthly recurring revenue. How much money are you making at that point in time? What is your burn rate? How much money is your company uh, consuming each month? And therefore, how much do you need to go and raise? So let's, let's go through a few of these at a time, right? The feature, the market, the NPS, and the MMR are basically engineering's job. Primarily the, the feature, but it needs to serve that market in particular and, and reach that level of satisfaction well enough to generate that revenue. The, uh, the revenue side of things in the market, that's more about the, uh, the sort of salespeople's jobs. The CEO's you know, got to be raising, got to be controlling burn along with the COO, got to be organizing all this stuff. So, if you design this really well and get buy-in from your team, there's almost nothing left for you to do as CEO because the company will just run itself. So there's a lot of boxes here, and to get everyone to agree on all of them will take a long time. So let's think about the most important ones. The 10-year one, that's where you should start. Why on earth are you taking the huge problematic issue of building a startup? Why are you doing that to yourself? All right. What is going to get you out of bed every morning and keep you up late at night? That's, that's your 10-year thing. Everyone's got to agree on that. You've got to spend a good half day with that and then come back a week later, check everyone still agrees. The one-month one. The one-month one is really important as well. The one-month one is uh, what are you guys all going to do right now? Right? Like, what are you actually working on today? Because if it's not in that one-month box, no one should be working on it. And then, there's one more row that's important, and that's going to be different for every company. And that is the row that is exactly halfway to when you run out of money. Because that is when you need to go out and get more money, if you need investment. So, if you've got 12 months in the bank, you're going to have to put a six-month row in there. If you've got two years, put a one-year row in. All right, that's when you've got to go out and get money. In fact, maybe a little bit earlier than that if you don't have too much money. So that's the goal grid. I work with people on it. The thing I like most about this is it resolves a lot of disputes. I've seen founders have two, three-hour arguments about what the company should be working on without realizing they were talking about different time periods. One of them's like, we absolutely have to build this feature, you know, like, or the company's just not worth doing. There's just no point. The company could not be valuable if we do not build this feature. And the other one says, there's no way we can get that feature done in time. And they just smash heads and until one of them goes, but I'm talking about five years from now. And the other one says, oh, I'm talking about a year. Oh, yeah, that's fine. No worries. And they're just, they're just burned two or three hours. I mean, there's some part of the human brain that thinks it's talking about the same time period as another human being that is just wildly miscalibrated. <laughs> it's terrible. All right, so save yourself that, that wasted time and, and do this. All right, so if you would like these cards, we have got a few samples uh, to hand out. If you sign up now at foundercards.com and show the uh, acceptance email to Jake and Roger, who are over by the door there, they will give you, oh, there's Jake, yeah. they will give you a set of cards. And the reason for that is that we would love to get your feedback on them. All right, so sign up at foundercards.com, get, uh, get a set of cards, tell us if they're useful or if they're not useful so we can fix them. Okay, that is... That is all I've got time for today. There's a big red sign flashing at me. 
Um, so I hope you're inspired about how we can save the world. I hope you are uh, willing to give uh, badinvestors.com a crack and uh, help us clean up some of the local scene. And I hope that Founder Cards proves useful for you. Uh, I have uh, Bronwyn at the door if you want to learn more about how to make university better. We've got Anastasia and Byron if you'd like to talk to them about the hardware they're working on. And uh, Roger and Jake will be floating around to hand out sets of cards. Thanks very much.